Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this panel called Women Entrepreneur, hosted by the Spain-US Chamber of Commerce in Florida, in partnership with Andalucía Emprende, a non-profit foundation that belongs to the regional government of Andalucía in Spain, and sponsored by Abanca, a bank with a global vision and presence in 11 countries that supports entrepreneurs, businesses, and individuals alike. For those of you that doesn't know uh, us, the Spain-US Chamber of Commerce is a nonprofit organization that helps companies doing business in the United States and provides support through consultancy services and a wide network of contacts. Please visit our website for more information at www.spainuschamber.com. Today, we will learn from three entrepreneurs about their experience, their achievements, and also their struggles, so that we could use their example in our projects and in our ideas. But before I introduce you to our panelists, I wanted to say that uh, we will be able to take questions from the audience at the end of this conversation. Please send your questions uh, in writing through the tab that says questions in the right uh, side of the control panel. And now let me introduce you the panelists that we have today. First of all, Laura Gonzalez Stefani. She is the founder and CEO of The Venture City, an operator led investor from first ticket to first round. The Venture City's product led growth focused support promising early stage to serious A startups around the world, in particular in the United States, Europe, and Latin America. Since founding the Venture City in 2017, Laura has supported over 60 companies through the first ticket product led growth program and an additional 25 companies through its first round fund. She's grown the reach of the Venture City to campuses in Miami and Madrid, as well as offices in San Francisco and Sao Paulo. An early employee of Facebook, Laura spent almost nine years supporting the platform's growth initiatives in Silicon Valley. Latin America, Spain, and Portugal. As Facebook's first international growth team executive in Europe, she led Facebook's development in Spain and Portugal. She then spearheaded Facebook's mobile and connectivity initiatives to LATAM as the growth mobile and partnerships director. Prior Facebook, Laura held management roles at eBay and Siemens and co-founded Esplaya.com the first beach tourism digital platform in Spain in 2000. An active equal rights advocate, angel investor, mentor, and board member, Laura was appointed to the board of the European Commission Innovation Council in the European Union. She also joined the CaixaBank Payments and Consumer Board, and she's enthusiastic about giving founders and innovation leaders the resources and support they deserve. And something that I saw in person is that she welcomes with open arms every entrepreneur and company that comes to Miami. Welcome, Laura Stefani. Thank you very much. My pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. So uh, we have also with us Andrea Lisbona, a CEO of Touchland. Originally from Barcelona and relocated to the US in 2018, Millennial, millennial entrepreneur Andrea Lisbona is setting out to disrupt the plate hand sanitizer industry with her innovative brand aimed at elevating everyday experiences. Touchland is a revolutionary brand of hand sanitizers that combine slick functional packaging with non-sticky moisturizing. You can see an example over here with luxurious filling formulas that come in eight amazing uh, scents. Lisbona ran a key starter campaign in 2018, which resulted in the branch reaching 450% of its initial fundraising goal, and more than 1,500 pre-order of the product in just one month. In Touchland's first year of business, the brand enjoyed success, largely driven by their community of social media followers. Uh, until recently, this community was growth and fostered directly by Andrea herself. In that year, Touchland surpassed 2 million in sales and landed retail distribution with Ulta, Urban Outfitters, Revolve, Liberty London, Sephora Mexico, and many more. Uh, Touchland's innovative uh, and 
superior design and quality has instantly embraced many celebrities and influencers as fans. While most hand sanitizers remained out of stock, Deutschland was able to ramp up production, clear regular FDA testing, and get back on the shelves within a matter of weeks. Now, Deutschland has been expanding into new retail partnerships with Target, Bloomingdale's, Neiman Marcus, Nordstrom, and many more. Additionally, the brand's Cub hand sanitizer dispenser, which is the first internet-connected solution of its kind, has exploded to represent 50% of their business with strategic partners like Equinox, Louis Vuitton, Sweet Green, Marriott, and dozens more. She holds an MBA from ESADE and was a feature expert speaker at the European Commission. She currently lives in Miami with her husband and Chippy and Coco, their beloved schnauzers, and in her spare time, she networks with other female entrepreneurs to share resources and advice. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And we have also with us Rashmi Melgiri. Rashmi is co-founder of Cover Wallet, a tech company reinventing the 100 billion commercial insurance market for small businesses. Cover Wallet launched in 2016 and raised 60 million from USV fund, uh, Foundation Index Ventures uh, to Sigma, Founder Collective, Han Greenberg, and Highline. Cover Wallet has uh, around 400 employees and hundreds of thousands of customers across the US. The company was acquired uh, by Aeon in January 2020, and I know that they also have uh, offices in Seville and Valencia as well. Rajmi is a frequent speaker at conferences and outspoken champion for women's leadership. She was named one of the 42 women in tech who crushed it in 2017 at TechCrunch and was part of the Crane's 40 under 40 class of uh, 2018. Rajmi holds a bachelor's degree in economics by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and an MBA from MIT Sloan. She is currently working on a new company in the payments space. Welcome, Rashmi. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So just before we begin, I would like to thank again Andalucía Emprende for their support and Abanca USA, our presenting sponsor. Abanca USA is part of Grupo Abanca, an international financial group with presence in 11 countries and with more than 5,000 employees, which goal is to combine the characteristics of a traditional bank with those of a modern bank that has at its core the satisfaction of their clients and innovation. Let's see a bit more about them. We live in a hyper-connected world, no matter where you are. Here where I am, there is potential for unlimited growth, thanks to technology and to people. Ici, il n'y a pas de frontières quand il s'agit d'être meilleur. Parce qu'ici, il y a plus d'opportunités que des préoccupations. Nos gusta ser de un mundo donde podemos confiar en los demás. De punta a punta, siempre de tú a tú. Vivo en un mundo que es más mundo porque es sustentable. Yo me siento que hay alguien a mi lado que me da seguridad, que me da la seguridad para poder encontrar soluciones juntos. Que me diga, estoy aquí, allí, en todas partes. So let's begin our conversation and we will have some time later to address also the questions from the attendees. So my first question will be for, for the three speakers. So it will be how did your idea or how did the idea of your business came up? And I would like to start maybe with Andrea, please. A bit short. Um, so I started Touchland because um, the reason why your mother would tell you when you were a kid to wash your hands is because hands are the door to an infectious disease. 80% um, of infectious diseases are spread through hands. So 
as we we used to go through life, taking planes, traveling, going on Ubers, and and all that. Um, most of the time, you don't have water and soap available. So truly, hand sanitizer, this commoditized, antiquated category that has existed for over twenty years, becomes your your best ally on the go. And everything before Touchland was very commoditized. It has like a very sticky experience. It smelled like tequila and vodka. Um, it cracked your skin. So I was wondering, how are you going to enhance people using hand sanitizer is, is, if the experience is so awful? So very similar to how Dyson or Nespresso, two categories that were fully commoditized and elevated into rituals of pleasure, our goal was to create a solution that would turn this boring habit into something that people look forward to. Um, and we we combine design experience and great formulation to really elevate this this daily hygiene ritual in, into a, a daily hygiene routine into a ritual that you look forward to. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you, uh, Laura. How about you? Because uh, Andrea is, is a product, and you can touch and feel it. But uh, how about the Venture City? How did you came up with that idea? So, so my story is a little bit more sad because I, I built my first company when I was 21 in Spain with Aya.com and just before the bubble, you know, the, the crisis, the dot-com bubble, and I didn't do very well. And part of it was because not there was not very much capital available and people preferred crazy companies uh, to invest on rather than, you know, uh, what we wanted to be as a tourism a, a company in you know in, in the world so we didn't succeed and, and based on that uh, you know years later working for other companies i landed in in san francisco in silicon valley when i was already at facebook and and i started to welcome you know uh different founders from all over the world from spain from latin america from north of europe and they all had the same issues that i was having back in the day 20 years before which was lack of capital, lack of support. And I was like, wow, if after 20 years, this keeps being the same issue, you know, this is something that I want to fix. And that's how the Venture City started. You know, we, we really wanted to, we are founders funding the next wave of entrepreneurs. And uh, that's basically how it started. Thank you so much, Laura. And Rashmi, how about you? How, how do you start with Cover Wallet uh, and, and get into that difficult world? How did your yeah. idea come up? Yep. Um, so my co-founder and I had this really simple question, I would say, which is when you think about the world of small businesses buying insurance for their business, it wasn't online in the way that you know, in the personal auto space, for example, in the US, you can go to progressive.com or geico.com and put in a bunch of information and get a quote that just didn't exist for business um, uh, business owners, right? Who were looking to insure their business. And so the way that all that was working is while it was 2015 and the internet <laughs> was obviously thriving, if you went online to look for insurance for your business, it would give you results that made it seem like you could get insurance, but in fact, you couldn't. There were two types of uh, results. One was companies that were essentially um, capturing your information and then selling it to insurance carriers or brokers. And then there were another type of company, which is the carriers themselves. So say like Liberty Mutual, um, that would ask for your zip code and then just send you out there to all the agents that were physically in your zip code. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, I often feel silly. Even back in 2015, I said I felt silly pitching Cover Wallet because it was such an obvious idea. Right. <laughs> People are going to want to yeah. buy this stuff online. Um, and so that's really what we set out to do. Uh, now, it involved in a bunch of work. And I think we were uh, naive in a good way in terms of what it would take to get there. Uh, but we eventually brought carriers alongside with us um, and were able to make that experience happen for small business owners where they could put in information and then at the end of the day, get a bunch of quotes that they could transact with online. So it was really just this noticing a um, need for that in, in the small business owner space and then going after it. Thank you, Rashmi. And now that I'm with you, the second question for the three of you, but I, I would like you to start with it. It's if you were to start over with the perspective on and learning gain over these years, would you change something? 
Yeah. Um, I wouldn't change anything about how we went about the business. Um, obviously, I think we spent time on things that didn't work out, et cetera. But I think there was always learning there. And I wouldn't change any of that. I think I'd give myself the advice, and I'm doing it now as I'm starting a second company, um, to, I think, not take things so personally. So I think as an entrepreneur, I was very wrapped up in terms of identity with the company. Um, and anything that I saw, this is a very common thing with entrepreneurs, often you're hiring someone to take over what you did um, because it's simply gotten bigger than your skill set, right? And that can happen. Um, and I would see the need for that in the company and be proud of myself in the sense that we've grown the company to a point where we can actually attract talent that's more experienced and um, you know, has this resume, but at the same time, I'd be hard on myself in terms of like, why can't I do it? Why aren't I the person to step into this role or maintain this role? So I have a real, much greater appreciation for um, just not identifying self-worth and identity with the company or my role at the company. Um, and I guess that's that's the one thing I would change. I'd go back and tell Rashmi, like, it's okay, calm down. <laughs> you know, don't take things so personally. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Laura, what about you? Would you change something from your past experiences? One thing uh, that I would have, you know, that I would have done differently is that uh, I'm very impatient. I am terribly impatient. And I, and I want things to get done fast. And, you know, in tech, a lot of times we say that done is better than perfect. Yes. And I embrace that, you know, I really want to test things out, get them to the market, see what the feedback of the potential consumers are and go back and polish and launch again, you know. But sometimes uh, that impatience takes you to the wrong places. And, and I think that I have hired too fast. Uh -huh. And uh, um, so in many ways, I didn't, you know, I, I should have had more time to think about things and... Uh, And I think that I have also invested in many things uh, too fast as well, without mm -hmm. waiting a little bit to see how things happened. Um, and and honestly, the the, the the thing is that you know when I left Facebook at the age at the age of 14 years old, I thought that you know my spirits were high. I've learned everything I had to learn in life, <laughs> in tech, in everything. Yeah. You know, I was with myself in many ways. And then you go back to start something from scratch again and boom, <laughs> first crash and boom, boom, second fast crash the next day. So it has been a tremendously humble experience. Is that you, if I was to change some, is that uh, life is continuous learning professional and personal mm -hmm. and uh, you can't give anything for granted you know that's what I would that's what I would say thank you uh, Andrea uh, what about you what would you change from this experience in in these few years with Touchland would you change something it's a tough question I always say that every mistake that I took took me to where I am today so um I would not change much. I think one of the things that we took a decision, and I don't know if we should have taken it faster, is to adjust the sales. Um, we developed a very innovative solution in 2014. We launched it in, in Spain. Um, we worked really hard, and we realized that we might not be in the right market. I think it's like a product market fit. And I think in our case, we had the right product, but we were not in the right market. And so in 2016, we took the decision to basically move to the U.S., start in the largest market for hand sanitizers, which represents 30% of the global demand. So always my question is, should we come here faster, like not in 2016, but maybe in 2012? Um, so, but at the end of the day, it worked out really good and we've been growing really fast. We have partners with every category leader in the U.S., both in B2B and wholesale. Um, so I share a lot of the things that uh, that both of them said, like the impatience. I'm very impatient. Sometimes it's annoying. And I understand that working next to me can get everyone very anxious because if I can do it yesterday, I don't want you to do it tomorrow. And then also I, I take things very personally. Um, I cannot sleep when I'm frustrated. I'm sending myself emails at 2 a.m. to remember things. And I think... I should sometimes not 
not be so much affected by any errors that are outside of our control and be able to navigate without feeling so frustrated. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Andrea. So next question, it would be, um, it's more of a philosophical question, but I have this with many people. Do you consider entrepreneurship spirit something that people have to be born with or that could be acquired with time? Laura, would you like to start with this one? You've seen a lot of entrepreneurs in your life. You're born with it. You know, you, 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 and I can, and I can see my dad was an entrepreneur. You could totally see that you have that grit and that, you know, hustle and that, you know, that spirit, you know, um, you, you can try. There's a lot of entrepreneur wannabes, you know, and now that, you know, it looks like it's super fashionable to be an entrepreneur, but it is by far the hardest job ever. You know, it's mm -hmm. and, and every time I meet a new entrepreneur, I, you know, or every time I say, look, from all the things that I've done in my life, nothing has been more complicated than trying to build my own businesses early on when I was 21 and later on when I was 40 plus, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I have a lot of respect for those that are able to live with such continuous pressure of not knowing if, you know, if what you're working on is going to fly or not, if what you're offering is adds the value enough to the founders that you're working with, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's very special. So I would say that it's not something that you learn over time. You know, you can definitely help entrepreneurs in many ways, but being an entrepreneur is something that comes like really into your DNA, that craziness. <laughs> it's not trying. No, you're, you're born with it. You're born with it. So, Rajmi, what do you think? Do you think that you are you need to be born with the entrepreneurial spirit, or you could acquire it? Yeah, I think um, I think you have to want it, and I agree with uh, that. It's so much pressure, and it's so hard that you have to have a certain level of grit and tolerance to even go through all the swings that will happen. That being said, I don't know if this directly answers the question, but it's it's been really fun uh, to watch how many entrepreneurs have been born out of cover wallet who started out as entry-level employees and got exposed um, because we were so transparent. And that was something my co-founder was really adamant about is transparency at the company, that they got exposed to entrepreneurship and they I kind of got to see the company grow from the inside out. And now there's there's so many of them that are out there and starting companies that I don't think I would have pegged them as entrepreneurs on day one when I met them. Um, so for me, I do think there's this aspect of exposure that can maybe, maybe you're born with it and maybe you just need to be exposed to it and know that it's possible and help see, you know, get to see a company go from 10 people to 400 people um, mm -hmm. to have you believe it's possible and that you can do it yourself. So I Both would say maybe, maybe you're born with it and, and exposure helps. <laughs> Thank you. Andrea, what do you think? Do you think it's something that it's you're born with or no? Well, I was raised in an entrepreneurial family. My father was an entrepreneur since I was born that I can remember. And I think like one of the skill sets that entrepreneurs has is navigate through uncertainty. There's a lot of people that really likes to know what's happening tomorrow, what's happening next month. With entrepreneurship and being an entrepreneur and leading a company, you truly don't know what's going to happen. Like every day you go to war, you get ready to go through hell. And I think there's a very unique skill set that keeps you, as, as, uh, as we all said, that keeps you going through all these beats and hard notices and like all of these challenges and everything. And you keep smiling and being, I always say, being a CEO is like chef energy officer. You have to be an energy. You, you cannot feel depressed when even when bad news arise and and keep inspiring everyone to continue following you through this craziness um, mm -hmm. so as laura said you have to be crazy to be an entrepreneur but it also is the most fulfilling job of all um, i would not change anything of it but i am surrounded by a lot of people and i know that 99.9 percent .9 of people like killing germs it 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 would not be able to go through what an entrepreneur has to go it's it's truly challenging and tough um, but it, it makes your life completely unique and fantastic 
Thank you. Thank you. I think it's a gene. I, I think it's a gene that you have it or not have it. Yeah. <laughs> or doesn't have it. Laura, uh, let's start with the specific questions. Um, you founded the Venture City, a model of investment and acceleration of tech companies. I guess you had the opportunity to learn about many different projects. What are the key factors to invest in them? So, uh, so you know, I'm a very weird investor, I have to say. Um, in fact, I hate that VCs are dead and their venture capital as, a, as, a, as such is going to be dead very soon because, you know, if you don't add value to the founders, they won't choose you as their investors, you know. So I am a little bit weird there. But what I have, what I have seen, what I have learned, and... Uh, we have right now over 120 companies that uh, we have invested on globally. What I have seen is that the you know the the more experience your capital alone is never helping them. It's not just you know the best entrepreneurs don't need capital; they choose you, right? It's not that the capital chooses them; they choose you, right? Because of your experience, because of how much you're going to lift them up when they're going down because of so many different things, right? So when, when I built the Venture City it was with the premise of, okay, if capital is not the only thing they, they, they need, they need product experience, they need data, uh, uh, you know, data analysis experience, they need engineering support, they need internationalization, playbooks and tactics to grow internationally. And that's, that's the premise that we offered. So before building it as an angel investor, I was testing myself, like, okay, am I adding value to these guys? If I am, I will say goodbye to Facebook and build my own thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I got good feedback, and that's how I ended up building this. But I think that we've been only four years around. We have a lot to demonstrate still. But the passion and our mission is, is clearly untouched. So, so hopefully we will make 100 years. <laughs> Hopefully, yes. But are there some key things that you look at it when you need to study a project or, or check if, if you like it oh, or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, yeah, what are the no, main two things yeah. that you look at? Yeah. Tech team, I need to have a minimum viable tech team, meaning CTO, product, and data, okay. and um, a data team. Uh, without that, we don't invest in tech. Okay. I, I only do software, and I love, you know, uh, crazy ambitious, big thinking founders. That's for me the key. Wonderful. I like that. I like Thank you so much, Laura. Andrea, uh, let, one question for you. You revolutionized the hand sanitizer market before COVID-19, the pandemic came to our, to our lives. Uh, what differential value do you offer to your clients in a market such as the US, which represents, as you said before, the 30% of the global demand of hand sanitizers and who already have a lot of multi multinationals that offer that product. So in order to revolutionize um, an industry, it's not just revolutionizing through the product, which we've revolutionized through, again, unique formulation. We were the first uh, hand sanitizer to be awarded with an allure vest of beauty. So we straddled the lines between hygiene and skincare, like eliminating like that drying effect of hand sanitizers and taking it to a more skincare forward solution. Um, it's a cost efficient solution, like every, every package delivers 500 mists. Um, so it lasts 20 times more than the gel bottles. We changed the form factor before Touchland, everything was gel and foam. We developed a liquid based solution. So we truly changed the way people perceive hand sanitizer before you use like that goopy ketchup experience with hand sanitizers. Um, and then with the B2B solution, the cube, it's again, design formulation, it's a smart. So we solve the biggest pain for businesses, which is managing refill and battery levels. So it basically alerts customers when refill and batteries are running low. Um, but we also revolutionize it, not just with the product, but we revolutionize it through, through the way we market it, the way we promote it in the market, the way we sold it in the market. We were the first hand sanitizer to be sold in Bloomingdale's, Neiman Marcus, in Nordstrom, like places that you would never expect to find hand sanitizer before mm -hmm. COVID. Now everyone sells hand sanitizer. Um, and we also revolutionize it through social media. Um, we, we've had a lot of success in social media, 10 million plus views in TikTok, 
we had celebrities of the size of Chris Jenner, Naomi Campbell promoting organically the product. So I think the viral coefficient of the product has allowed us to grow so fast in, in social media with the, without like big multinational uh, budgets. Um, so it's been a combination. I always say in order to be successful, in, it's not just creating a beautiful product. It's a really good strategy of uh, re reinventing this industry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, Rashmi, let's go uh, with you. Cover Wallet, it's currently the leading digital insurance platform for small and medium businesses. And, and I have to say that we are going to become your clients very soon. So uh, what are the main factors that took the startup there uh, on that specific industry to be now the leader of that? Yeah, so I would say some of it is our grit as entrepreneurs and fighting against a lot of dynamics that um, the insurance industry had in place in 2015. Um, so some of the things that were going on were, as I mentioned, it was you know largely if it was small business insurance, it was sold by these neighborhood agents. And so carriers would see anyone like us coming to them and saying, hey, we want to take you online. You would think maybe that that's an automatic yes for them. But some of it was a lot of hesitancy around channel conflict and, um, you know, not wanting to disturb the neighborhood agents or, or make them mad by saying, hey, we're going to go online and work with a digital agent. So I think there was um, a great amount of persuasion that came from me and my co-founder and the leadership team to actually convince carriers that this was in their best interest. So a lot of analysis and persuasion to get them to even try going online for the first time and, you know, risking channel conflict, for example. The thing that ultimately made us, I think, very successful with the small business owners who were online was this insistence on having a 21st century uh, experience, right? Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is why shouldn't it be as simple to buy a insurance policy and to set up automatic payments as it is when you sign up for Spotify, right? Um, so even the billing aspect of the way the insurance industry was working was a lot of carriers didn't even accept credit cards because they didn't want to deal with the fees. Mm -hmm. um, they were happy to accept paper checks. Um, to go on automatic or recurring payments with them was something that you had to select into as opposed to it being defaulted. And so a lot of this stuff just didn't make sense to my co-founder and I. We're like, well, all these like, you know, modern companies, they work on auto pay, right? And they work yeah. on accepting credit cards. Um, so I'm just giving you two examples, but it was an industry that was very much set in its ways and honestly didn't, didn't have a lot of competition or a lot of... Um, it wasn't being poked at to actually think differently. And I think that that's what we really brought was, again, this is an insistence. I would just call it an insistence on the customer experience being a modern one. And that allowed us to succeed with the small business owners. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Laura, uh, let's go with you. I, I guess that you have seen many interesting projects that have finally been unsuccessful. Uh, what do you think that uh, are the most common mistakes that usually brings to failure a, a good idea? Yeah, well, I can talk about my mistakes, uh, happy. Uh, so I think that ideas are not worth anything. I think that execution is what really matters. Okay. I'm sorry if I'm very <laughs> direct, mm -hmm. but I think that uh, what makes things possible is the execution of, of the right team. Mm -hmm. So I, ha I think that ideas, you know, things that I, it didn't work well for me in my first company. You know, I think that not setting the right alignment between the founders is one of the most common mistakes. Not choosing the right investors. You know, you have reporting investors and investors that help. Uh, sometimes the ones that ask more reporting are the ones that have more capital. Mm -hmm. So uh, focusing on the capital rather than on the experience is a wrong way to look at an investor. And so that's a very common mistake. You know, those that are willing to give you more money than what you really need to take the business to the next level. I think another mistake is, you know, as an entrepreneur, you tend to be over optimistic because you're so in love with what you're doing. You believe in it. And sometimes you don't get the feedback that the market is telling you, like okay. this is not working. And they insist and you insist and you feel that you're going to educate the market, but the market does. <laughs> Easy to educate, or 
it's very expensive to educate it. So I think that unrealistic, you know, I love founding teams when there is someone that visions, that has the vision mm -hmm. and uh, it's the ambitious one. And then the other founder that boom, it helps you put the feet on the ground and balance that things out, you see. But those are the things that I have seen and the things that I have experienced in my life as a mistake. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing those with us. Um, Rashmi, one question for you. Um, Cover Wallet secured investment from companies such as uh, Union Square Ventures, Index Ventures, or Foundation Capital, among others. What advice would you give to other entrepreneurs that are willing to attract the attention of investors and acquire the necessary funding to carry out their projects? Taking into account what Lara just said, that don't take someone that is offering you more money than what you need. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, I'm going through this a little bit myself right now, or at least thinking through the parameters that I would use to evaluate investors. Um, I think folks who have industry experience in what you've done, and it doesn't have to be the exact industry, but you know, something adjacent or have ideas in, in adjacent spaces is invaluable. Um, I, I personally have really benefited from investor conversations where it's open and we can brainstorm in a way and I don't have to come to it saying, hey, this is fully baked. I think it's, you know, it's great to have investors who've, who've been in the space and you're not just educating them <laughs> on all the names and all the dynamics and then asking for a check, um, but they've actually done some thinking and they have some theses and they're pushing you to think differently. Um, to me, that's, that's incredibly important. Um, the other piece that I would say is, I mean, I think well-connected investors, right? Um, so like looking through their networks and the people they've worked with in the past is really invaluable, um, not just for early customers, but to other, um, for partnerships. You know, I think that was something that really launched Cover Wallet in the early years was getting connected to some um, high profile carriers through the network of investors that we had. Um, and then vouching for us as entrepreneurs, even though, you know, we had nothing but a PowerPoint. Um, so I would say that's probably the second piece I'd look for the most. Um, and then I agree with Laura, like, you know, especially in today's environment, there's a, and she'd probably agree, like funding is, is easier than it used to be like five years ago. So it, it's not really about the capital. Or I would, let me say this, that I think a lot of entrepreneurs, even first time entrepreneurs will have their choice. And so to really, um, you know, vet the entrepreneurs that you think are going to put, excuse me, will vet the investors that you think are going to push you on your ideas and, and get you to something that's, um, that's sustainable and it's going to work. Okay. Thank you so much, Rashmi. And Andrea, a question for you. Um, with the arrival and subsequent expansion of COVID-19, uh, Touchland increased sales by 1,200%. How did you face this challenge that could become a problem if the company couldn't scale at the same pace? Yeah, I think we, we experienced a lot of challenges since we launched in the US. We were the hand sanitizer brand uh, with 34,000 people waitlist. Um, so our challenge has always been keeping up with the demand, especially as we landed amazing partners such as Alta who launched us in January 2020 in 1,200 doors and we were fully sold out within seven days. Um, so again, as a consumer goods company, our goal has been, on, I dedicate a lot of time to supply chain. Um, so making sure that we would get maximize production to get the, the product in as many people as possible. We made sure um, also in, in the in the moments that we were living, especially with frontline workers, not having access to hand sanitizers to fight COVID. One of the, the initiatives that we took with our Touch Lives campaign, which is our social initiative, is for every container that we would receive, we dedicated 5% of, of the goods to be shipped to, to frontline workers. And then we shifted the campaign in Q4 2020 into the teachers um, campaign, public school teachers, basically as kids are returning to school and some public schools don't have like PPE to receive kids back to class. One of the things that we're doing is offering public school teachers, dispensers and 10,000 hand washes per, per um, teacher so their kids can go back to class safe. So again, 
I think for, from us, like for a company that is constantly, constantly growing so much, like just focusing on getting supply up to date, making sure that you um, have enough product, that you have contingency plans, that you evaluate all of the all of the risks to make sure that you are not sold out. Um, because again, that that's one of the challenges that we've been experiencing since launch. And it's fantastic for headlines on PR to have 34,000 people wait this, but it is again uh, one of our goals to to reduce that and to be fully on stock, which is something that that again, due to the high demand that we've had since the beginning, it's been our one of our biggest challenges. Thank you, and I believe that now with the problems with logistics and supply chain worldwide, it's it's not easy for you either. We are manufacturing on the U.S., so um, we are not experiencing the challenges that uh, the ports, the sea freights with the ports loaded for, for days and days. Um, this is something that, again, at the end of the day, you have to evaluate not just where you manufacture, also logistics and everything as, uh, as the world is changing constantly. Thank you. Thank you. Lara, um, a question that uh, we were also uh, discussing the other day, um, and I would like to, to know your your opinion, or I would like to share your opinion with, with the rest. It's uh, as of today, only two out of 10 women get the needed investment for their projects. What would you say are the obstacles that they face and, and what measures could be implemented to overcome them? Okay, it's, it's interesting. So um, this comes from the heart, right? So in my career, I have not faced ever any uh, limit in terms of the people that I've worked with, ever. I think it is because I have, I have a very strong personality, and maybe if they tried, I didn't even see that they wanted to limit my career. That's number one. And I have had both men and women as bosses and managers throughout my career. I think that the problem is that um, most of the capital is in the wrong hands today. If you look into you know, the world of capital is all gentlemen in suits, right? And that's not, that doesn't represent how the world looks like today, right? There, there's no question that being a woman and a mother and a professional and a founder or a fund manager implies a lot of sacrifices. It is, it is, it, it is a fact. I have missed, I have three kids and I have missed so many amazing moments of my kids because I'm so in love with my career. And it's part of my life. So, so I think that finally now everybody around the world is really thinking about what are the changes to do to make the world a more inclusive so that women with a lot of talent can really get where they want to get without needing to sacrifice that much. And at the same time, there's a lot of gentlemen over there that understand that their wives or to be wives want to really uh, have a career on their own. So I think that uh, finally, because there's more awareness than ever, and we are speaking about it in a much more spontaneous way than ever, we are shaping uh, the, 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 the future is female, basically. And so uh, we are shaping it as we speak. My mother was a first generation of Spanish woman working outside the house. So maybe my personality and the way I embrace my career is very well and it doesn't happen with many of the mothers of my friends but i think that by having role models and by having people that have been able to combine everything they want in life everything will be easier let's not tolerate anybody to limit our life or anything we want thank you thank you for sharing that uh, rashmi um one question for you. Um, I imagine that in Cover Wallet's uh, case, one of the main challenges that you faced is the complex regulation that exists in, in the industry, not only on the federal level, but also on the state level, where it could be different between states. Uh, how did you manage to solve such complicated issue when you wanted to simplify everything and, and uh, allow people to, to do all that stuff uh, online. Yes, um, we definitely experienced a lot of regulatory um, hurdles. Let me say overhead. Uh, I don't think that we fully solved it, <laughs> but um, I would say it's it's more a um, it's more a decision about 
what you're going to prioritize. And so I think there's a lot of companies that um, first want to find out the regulation and in that way be very conservative and then they'll build their company inside of that regulation, right? And then there's companies that say, I've got a vision and I want to build it this way and then I'll check the regulation and I'll make decisions about what I think is a gray area uh, and I'll venture out there and I'll let the regulators come to me uh, and tell me it's a gray area and then I'll have a conversation about it. You can probably guess which one uh, Coverwall was, right? <laughs> uh, but as I, uh, and, you know, I don't think we ever broke any rule that was black and white, but going back to what I said earlier, there was this insistence that things should look a certain way from the customer. Uh, perspective. And so we started there and then, you know, we saw where we were in the gray areas and we would have conversations and we would work through it. Uh, but my advice would be on this, right? Like, and Uber's the same way, uh, yeah. you know, they, they were, they dealt with the regulation when it came up, right? And they had a vision of what it should be like uh, from the onset. Um, I would just advise entrepreneurs to, to work in that second way, because I mean, the truth, unless it's really egregious, the, the, the truth is you're small and to some extent you don't matter. Um, <laughs> so you might as well be testing out there while you're small, seeing what works with customers and then figuring it out uh, from there. And I think there's plenty of examples who, of companies that today are very successful that we're treading in that gray area. Yes, I remember the, the first company that I saw behavior that way, it was Uber. But definitely they were, well, you know, in the middle, no, in the in the the line, the thin line, but they deal with regulation later, and well, we see how how they are today. So thank you so much, thank you so much for for that, um, Andrea. Question for you: uh, Naomi Campbell, Tyra Banks, Ariana Grande, or Lady Gaga are mm -hmm. some of the Touchland Declare fans uh, who have even promoted your product uh, on their social media without any collaboration agreements. Tell us. A little bit more about that. How do you think that they found the product and why do you think they love the product so much? And if you see a direct impact any every time that they post something related to Touchland in your in your sales or, or not, or if it doesn't work that way. Well, I think that one of the reasons why we've been very successful is um, the design of the packaging. Um, we designed this packaging in 2014. Last year, we suffered more than 2,000 patent infringements. <laughs> so <laughs> it, we, we received a lot of copycats uh, last year, which, which took a lot of our time sending cease and desist letters to everyone. Um, but uh, yeah, this has been one of the reasons that it has caught the attention we have never had to pay anyone to promote the product, which is something that I'm very proud of. Like if you are capable to build the product that celebrities truly love, it's the best way that you can scale. Um, it's the vital coefficient, which is something that happens once in a million, but we, we really found that when we, we moved into the US, launched the product in the US, launched the new formulations with, uh, with the new sense and everything, um, we, we it happened in so many ways. We work with a lot of um, makeup of celebrities, hairstylists of celebrities who are interacting constantly with people. They love Touchland. Um, we we give them our product and they use it when they are like working with these celebrities. Celebrities see it, they ask what is it, and so so it goes. Um, so so every time that we've had one of these celebrities showing up, we of course, spend a lot of time Google Analytics, seeing the peaks up and down. So every time that we see any sort of like organic peak, normally it's related to either press or like celebrity or someone that has posted on TikTok or a video that has gone viral. We have so many ways for us to see peaks that sometimes we have to go to the detail and sometimes even call customers to really understand, hey, how did you find the brand? And sometimes it's because we've had like a full page editorial on Real Simple and it's driving a new target demographic that we didn't even know or or because they see it because Chris Jenner was was promoting it. Mm -hmm. And well, in line with uh, marketing strategies, uh, Touchland addresses a diverse audience. For example, in 2021, you launched a very provocative advertising campaign set in an underground party in New York City. And at the same time, you partnered with Disney, creating a limited edition of your product with the image of Mickey Mouse. What do you think are the keys to deliver a message that allow you to cover such a diverse profile consumer without failing into contradictions? 
I think it's authenticity. Um, when we did the campaign in 2021, like in August, when we relaunched uh, with the new essence and everything, we did a campaign that truly um, wanted to set us apart of all these opportunistic brands that launched during COVID. Um, we launched way before COVID when no one was interested in hand sanitizers and we truly <laughs> worked hard to make it happen. So we we made this campaign that truly empowers people to go out, to feel life. Like at, at the end of the day, we all miss being human. I'm tired of saying hi with my elbow. I think it's anti-natural. Um, so we wanted to kind of like tell what everyone is thinking. We all miss traveling, we all miss partying, we all miss having fun. And we want people to feel passionate and and curiously and everything, but not recklessly. Um, so the campaign is all about that. Like we, you can go out, have fun and still like with a simple spritz in your hands, stay healthy. Um, and then when we did a month later, um, we've never done a brand partnership before. Touchland is all about joy, like creating those moments of joy, like spraying these. It smells so good. It makes you happy. So we did a campaign with a brand that truly inspires and breathes joy, which is Disney. And we did it in a very authentic way. So instead of like doing it in like, we were the first adult hand sanitizer partnership for Disney. And if you've seen the packaging, I have it actually here, which is working as my laptop <laughs> table. Um, <laughs> but it's an inspired um sort of pop art Andy Warhol uh, frame uh, that you can open it up in the middle and have like these uh, four bottles customized with Mickey. So it's it's like a very Touchland Disney partnership. So it, it's not the typical Disney item. I think it has like this sort of like design and minimalism and coolness that Touchland also has. Thank you so much. Uh, Laura, let's return with you. Um, with something that I would like to, to touch also for the audience that it's not based in the U.S. There is this general idea uh, in which many people believe that to be successful in the tech industry, you need to be in Silicon Valley. Do you agree with that? And you know what it means to be there. Uh, yeah, I think that in Spain, I don't know what's the word in English, we have these kind of complejos absurdos. So I don't remember the name in in Espanol. Uh, we, we think so. So sometimes we don't trust our instincts. Somehow it can be the translation. I mean, Silicon Valley is great. There is a lot, you know. There's definitely a mix of universities creating extraordinary entrepreneurial talent, as Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, Berkeley, and then you have all these crazy investors that are serial entrepreneurs that made it a few times investing in the next wave. And then there are uh, all these capital, venture capital firms that started 25 years ago deploying big amounts of capital. But, there was a but, it's super expensive living over there. The same way that you find a lot of these, there's a lot of competition because there's way more in, uh, um, entrepreneurs than anywhere else. In the world is far away from the rest of the world. I know that March my is That's true. same time frame, but it is oh my god, it's nine hours time difference with Europe in many ways. And um and and there's a very specific mindset. Good and bad is very it's not very diverse in many ways, but on the other side is very ambitious and they think big and they think crazy and they make it happen. But if you were to look into the amount of capital deployed versus the number of unicorns, the number one country in the world would be Estonia, then Uruguay, and most likely four or five would be Spain. Comparing the amount of capital yeah. that is deployed into entrepreneurs versus the number of unicorns created, right? So it's not everything as it looks. In Silicon Valley, of course, it's great to go and visit and feel the air, but you know what? Built from Spain, built from Madrid, Barcelona, Valencia, Malaga, Sevilla, incredible talent in Spain, from Spain to the world, and it's much more efficient in terms of capital. And today, our founders are much more uh, aggressive and ambitious. So, yes, we just need you. to get the capital to build. It's just quite slacking. Yes. But the Yes, the, the need of capital. I think that would be the main difference. No, there's more capital there than, than it is in Spain. But things are changing. We don't, don't, have, you think? We don't have not even one billion 
euro fund in Spain. We don't. The biggest fund, again, venture capital in Spain is 130 million. How are you going to build your fund with that? No. We need to have five, one billion at least, and 2,500 million funds in Spain to really be able to support the time that we have. We have uh, our expectations in the venture city and in you. So please bring the first 1 billion euros uh, found to Spain soon, sooner than later. Well, it's not just me. I think that there are very many fund managers in Spain already, by the way, female. I think that they are from Seaja Ventures. She has three unicorns, three. She And she's a woman, by the way. And uh, she's one of the best investors that you can work with in Europe. So I think that we have the talent. It's just that we don't have the mindset. But we will get there. We will get there. For sure, we will get there. We're getting there. Thank you, Lara. Uh, Rashmi, you are involved in a new project at this time. Um, what can you tell us about it? Is there anything new you're learning in this new entrepreneur experience that you can share with us? Or a secret? Yeah, no, it's, uh, I can tell you generally what it is. So, um, and I think there's a little piece of advice in there in, in, buried in there as well, which is um, what I'm working on is a something generally uh, in the billing, payments, and accounting space servicing the insurance industry. So the little piece of advice is do what you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, and uh, I say that because I would say, you know, Coverwalt was uh, from launch to acquisition was about five years. And the last year and a half of um, the company's independent existence, I was spending 80% of my time on uh, the financial operations of the company. So I described earlier that what we were really good at was delivering a customer facing experience that was on par with what you'd expect from a web company. Um, but like any high growth startup, uh, you were not, we weren't really investing in the back. Um, and so to some extent, a lot of it was manual um, and all the tools that were out there to, to help us make it not manual were just far too expensive. And when you're high growth, you'd rather take a dollar and invest it in growth than you would in an accounting system, for example, right? In okay. yes. um, tech or companies in this space have just, really exploded in the last three years in terms of how many new companies are out there. And uh, part of, you know, my thesis when I left Coverwallet was like, wow, you know, there really should have been something that was more insurance specific that was helping companies in this space that were new um, because all the existing solutions out there were too expensive and were almost overbuilt for what we needed to do. So um, I'd say uh, it's not a secret, uh, but I am being a little, um, unclear about exactly what it is right now and intentionally uh, because it's generally, you know, something in the payment space for the insurance industry. And I, uh, I'm super excited about it. Uh, I have my co-founding team and I have a small team of engineers and we're working on some early prototypes. Um, but uh, yeah. Good. No, congratulations. We'll, we'll, we'll follow you closely to see where you get with that. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So my, my last question would be for the three of you. Um, you are examples of entrepreneurs who were brave enough to bet on your projects and made them come true. Can each of you tell me two key things that would define a successful entrepreneur? Maybe you are aligned on these two. Maybe you have different... but. Give me your, your main two key factors. We can start with Andrea, for example, to define a successful entrepreneur. So I think it's having, first of all, good instinct um, that you can follow and trust your gut. And then the second one would be perseverance um, mm -hmm. to having the capacity to overcome challenges with head the head up and and not giving up when things get get hard i think th those are the two two um skills that i think have helped me navigate through through this these years lara what about you which two you i, I agree up? absolutely with Andrea. i think that perseverance should be one and the second one i would think should be optimism you know like no matter how hard you hit the wall stand up and <laughs> You know, so those are the two. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And Rashmi, what about you? What do you think would be the the two main factors? 
Yeah, I definitely agree with optimism. That's certainly required. Um, so I think it's it's the combination of two things. It's grit. So just grinding through whatever the problem is. I'm going to give you three things. Grit, <laughs> I think coupled with grip is confidence. So when you have this impossible problem in front of you, the only way to actually muster your way through it is you have to be confident enough to think that you can solve it. Um, and then I think the third piece is also optimism, like they said. So you have to, um, I, I love what um, someone said earlier around the CEO being the chief energy officer. Mm-hmm. I think that in order to have an enterprise, you have to bring that energy. Um, and part of that is optimism. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll keep those, those advices in hand. We have a few questions and we have some time, not much time, but we have a few questions from, from the audience that I would like to share with you. So the first question that we have here is, did you feel at some point that you have reached your limit and wanted to leave the project? Who would like to answer that? I can answer. Never. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Never, never, never. Even it's even it's so hard. You are op- optimistic enough and perseverance enough to overcome those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Another question that we have here: um, Do you believe in the concept of fail fast and fail smart to approach mistakes more proactively? Yeah. You know, I, I, I think that in our culture, the Hispanic culture, nobody talks about failure. And I think that's a huge failure itself. I think that we should normalize a lot more making mistakes. So, of course, fail fast and go big, you know. Fail big and fast, and that's the best way to learn. It, it is painful, but it's, it's, you know, you won't forget from the mistakes you've made. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely something in our culture that we need to really tweak to talk about failures. Okay. Another question that I have here. Um, I have a service business of mental health. I have changed my focus of or business path. Have you ever been lost on your business to the point of having to change your path or audience? Yeah. Many times, yeah. That we call it pivoting. Okay. <laughs> we pivot every month. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's part of the strategy. And that's another question that's... for for Lara. Uh, Lara, does Venture City invest in tech companies only? Do you support mental health companies as well? We have a couple of mental health businesses. Uh, Umore is one of them based in Portugal. It, but but I distinguish between tech enabled and tech driven. I just do tech driven. I don't do tech enabled. Tech enabled would be someone that is digitalizing whatever that word means. Um, a, you know, uh, a, a mental health practice. What I do is you know artificial intelligence driven decisions and and stuff. It's much more uh, complicated. But yes, I do invest in mental health. I think it's one of the it's one of the things to invest in the future. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, one question for for Rashmi: uh, Do you feel that it is valuable to use the end user dash design thinking approach to building and scaling your businesses to ensure that you always have the customer in mind through the growth cycles? Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's like has to be the key ingredient is um, identifying who your user is, and sometimes your user isn't the person who's paying for it. Um, but identifying who that user is and then building a good experience for them is, I, I think, a, a critical ingredient to, to to building your company. Right, you have to get that right. Okay, um, thank you, thank you so much. And one question for Andrea. Andrea, having studied and lived in Barcelona, uh, where would you say it's easier to start a project and why? I would say in the US, <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why I moved here. Um, I feel like um, in the US, the ecosystem of startups and investors and possibilities and programs and everything, it's, it's much bigger. Um, 
So that's one of the reasons why I decided to pack my suitcases and move over here. And it's been night and day. Um, I was selling almost the same product in Spain and, and having a small success, let's say. And then suddenly the same idea, same concept, you put it into another market and it, it's like almost like a new brand. So I, I do believe that when you, when you think big, um, being in the U.S., the possibilities, the speed of the market, the scalability and everything, and the consumism, of course, if you have like a product, it's it's the best place to be. Thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, Laura, we have a question for you. Um, would you recommend acquiring experience in a company before embarking on your own project? Or would you say that what you have learned entrepreneuring, you would have never learned in a company? Tough question. Uh, I have worked for big multinationals such as Siemens. I have worked in companies that became like Facebook, like became tremendous big. And I have built my own company successfully and unsuccessfully. I I learned from every experience in my life. I you know I wouldn't be able to say where do I learn more or less. What what I can tell you is that I find corporates. And I'm sorry with what I'm going to say. I hope that nobody kills me. But I find corporates the best place to learn what you do not want to do. Okay. That, that's a good guidance. That's a really good guidance. And I'm an entrepreneur. So that's my... <laughs> and I'm impatient. Very good. Very good. And I think we have a final question. Um, it, yes, I have um, one question that we have. for This is for Rashmi. Uh, I have several ideas that I could carry out, but they are all offered by other companies. How would you recommend me to make myself visible and stand out from the others? Mm. So I think the question that you have to answer for yourself is why should you exist, right? So mm. if these other companies are offering the same thing, um, you need to justify to yourself why there's room for you to exist alongside of them. So that might be, it might be the same product, but it could be a different customer service experience. Uh, it might be the same product, but your, your go to market or who you're distributing through is different. Um, so I wouldn't get bummed out because it's the same product per se, but you do need to answer for yourself what facet of getting that product into the hands of the user is different and why that's valuable. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. And someone is, is writing here, my company is insured by Cover Wallet. <laughs> All right. <Yeah. laughs> well, we have, we have to end here. And before I go, I want to remind everyone that this conference will be available in the YouTube channel of the Spain-US Chamber of Commerce. So please visit our website, which is www.spainuschamber.com. Thanks to Andalucía Emprende for their support and thanks to Abanca for making possible this event today. And special thanks to our panelists. It's been a pleasure talking to you and learning about your experience in the entrepreneurial world. I hope that we could meet in person soon, get together, have a drink together and discuss things in person. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have Thank you. A have a great day. Have a rest, uh, great rest of your day and goodbye.